Hey, Morgan here. I'm um, back for one more Cinevlog. It's probably going to be the last of this year. And I debated back and forth whether or not to do this one. Um, sorry. Dog likes to play tennis. That's a new thing now. This is why I never get my videos done. I'm always busy with her. Anyway, moving on. Um, I was debating back and forth whether or not to do a vlog about this movie. Because um, I saw it weeks ago. But... I still kind of sort of remember portions of it and my own opinions about it. Um, and this week, something very unfortunate happened surrounding the said film. So I figured it was pretty much for the best. Um, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. It's uh, one second here. This is the reason why I don't do my videos. This is the reason. So yeah, a lot of things have been happening this week, unfortunately, um, most notably a very huge passing that's connected to this film. So I figured for the best, and just for the sake of it, might as well talk about Rogue One Star Wars story, so uh, Carrie Fisher, this is for you. Um, I saw this a few weeks ago at a Thursday screening when it was coming out. And let me tell you, the room was massive. Even when me and my folks got in there early, we thought, okay, we're going to get a good seat. It's 6.30. No, the theater was already packed. <laughs> there was, like, many fans talking about certain things, like, oh, it's not the same without the crawl, or, oh, they're going to do this. Oh, it's so good to be here, so that way we don't have to hear all the gossips from our friends. And there was one guy that was like that throughout the whole entire time, throughout the whole movie. Um, and when they went to the opening, and they didn't have the opening crawl, he was like, Ugh, they don't have a crawl. Jerks! And then when the movie was done and the end credits came up, I heard him go, That was beautiful! Like, idiot! Don't judge a movie just because it has one thing that it doesn't have for the fans. Speaking of which, this was a Christmas gift my sister got for me. It's a... <laughs> it's Labyrinth. Uh, take care, David Bowie. Oh, man, I love Labyrinth, but I like Dark Crystal marginally better. Um, yeah, speaking of fans. <laughs> so, I was with my mom, who's also really big on Star Wars. She grew up on them when they came out. Like, she was born in 62. So, when those films came out, they made a pretty big impact on her. And last year, when Force Awakens came out, me and her kind of had the same reaction, and I still have the same feelings towards that one. It's an interesting movie for what it is, what it's trying to do, but I still feel disappointed in it. It rehashes way too much. I personally feel like they could have had something with these characters, and they do. I like Finn and the fact that he's debating whether he should be a human or a weapon. Um, not Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren's the villain. Um, oh, what's her name? Shoot, 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 shoot. Uh, not, not, not offends the, the Stormtrooper guy. Uh, I feel bad. I feel really bad. Um, what's her name? Yes, I remember her well. She's good old what's her name. She makes off with that uh, robot that has a soccer ball. And, uh, uh, this is awkward. Um, uh, no, no, that's the villain's name. Ray. Oh, Ray, Ray. Man, I'm bad at this. Um, but yeah, those two, they started off interesting, but the story obviously repeated itself, and that ruined the enjoyment, because it led to one crucial moment near the end, and the minute I called it, and the minute they did said scene, I was like... Uh, man, I want to walk out, but my sister and her boyfriend are here, so I gotta stay for the ride. <sighs> but no, I didn't get that feeling with Rogue One. I didn't get that feeling that they were repeating things. I mean, they do repeat a couple of you know, tropes, like the loner that, you know, is stuck in that life and wants to break out and do something big and ends up doing something big and helpful for this whole other big cause. And 
pretty much, I'm going to try and talk about this movie without any big spoilers. There is going to be a section near the end devoted to the the biggest of the spoilers. I'm just going to talk about the minor stuff. Because really, what does it really talk about this movie when so many have talked about it and you can't put your two cents in? There's a couple of things I can kind of, sort of defend, but at the same time, um, it's like, eh, it is what it is. So I'm going to try and concentrate while my dog eats her bone. Nylon bone. Oh, never mind. So the whole movie is set as a link to the very first Star Wars movie, which is now called Episode Four: New Hope, and it's supposed to show how the Rebels snuck in and stole the Death Star plans. All right, fine. Um, and I like how they connected pretty well to the first movie and explain certain things. And just as it own, and just on its own, it works fine. It works really, really fine. It's a very simplistic story, even if it is trying to be this big, grand, epic way when it's not needed. The fact they jump from different planet to planet, um, the characters are given like these basic backgrounds and such, which we don't even remember or care. And to be honest, I, I will admit, going looking back at my um, blog review, there are things I do like in the first half, even if it is slow. Um, I do like the main lead. Uh, right, so here we go again. Blanking out. I don't want to. 2016 is already a bad year, and I don't want to. I want this to happen to me. Oh, William. <laughs> oh, no. I feel pathetic right now. Um, Jen. 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 I'm sorry, Jen. Um, I like how she's very rebellious, and she doesn't understand exactly the cause and effect that things. She's just trying to be on her own and figure things out. And then when she learns that she's a bigger part of this whole cause that's going on, this Death Star being built and everything, that's when she sort of realizes, oh yeah, there is a reason for me to be here. And she starts realizing how crucial and important she is to this whole battle equation. Um... I like these characters and the group they have. They get together and try to um, get this plan to steal the original blueprints, which are on these giant hard drive disks, which I guess shows this whole universe relies on digital technology as much as we do now, which is kind of ironic. Um, I, I like the, the the captain guy who's you know very all for the cause and stuff but knows that there's certain limits when trying to learn and respect his uh, him himself and others around um, there's a scene where he's ordered to assassinate someone very very crucial and yet he knows how big of an impact it will be and he backs off on it like it's such a very tense moment where he's on the rocks and he has this little scope down there and he's like so close to like uh, killing this one dude who could really do some damage to not just um, the galaxy but everything else in question um, but then he second thinks it and he realizes something is not right here this this doesn't feel right I, I shouldn't really assassinate this person and they don't do it in dialogue. They don't do it in dialogue either. They just show basic emotion. And I like that. I, I thought that was actually a great moment. Um, I like the other companions that they have. The the K250 character, I, I think that's his name, uh, who's voiced by Alan Tudyk, um, who's literally C-3PO if he was more badass. And he's pretty much, if you took R2-D2, instead of having him beep a lot, you actually had him talk. You get a very sarcastic robot. He's the robot from Lost in Space, only more comedic and very impending, and he'll literally put his life on the line just to save anybody. And he has a lot of great lines and a lot of great scenes. Um, he's an Imperial droid that's reprogrammed, so there's obviously traces of his brutality in there. There's a scene where they're breaking in, and he's just shooting stormtroopers and he has no care which makes it funny because he's sitting there trying to do his little thing it's like oh stormtrooper bang he's just <laughs> it's like a bb gun to pigeons it's amazing okay i'll just save you guys oh hold on bing okay I just... oh hold on bing okay bing um and he's just a really really fun character it's just oh my goodness um 
there's also this pair here, um, a blind monk-like character who believes in the ways of the Force and may or may not be a Jedi, even though it's not confirmed. And that works fine. Um, and then there's this other guy with him who's all shoot and don't talk. He has like this really cool gun and everything. Uh, guns a blazing, you know, and it's a nice little yin and yang kind of thing going on there. And I think with the characters, there's there's interesting quirks for who they are and what they resemble. But in terms of how well they're remembered, I think they're more remembered for their quirks rather than being actual characters. And that becomes a big crucial point near the end, where when one of them happens, when, when something happens to one of them, it's a case where you're going to either feel bad for what happens to them, or it's going to be a case where you're like, oh, that kind of happened. I mean, I, I feel bad, but the fact that this is the only Star Wars movie they're going to be in, spoiler alert, um, it really makes it all the more impacting when you have these people together and you really know them more for their quirks and who they are. And even though there is a personality, you kind of sort of don't feel sold on it. Um, it's kind of like James Cameron's. It's kind of like James Cameron's Aliens. You have that whole militant crew there, and even though you know them for, for their quirks, you know that there is personality, and there actually is um, a soul with each one of them, despite the fact that they're all militant and able to go in there and kick alien slime. And here, they try to do the same thing, but. There's not much of a personality because of the focus being on more of our main leads, Jen and the, the captain. So you're really left there wondering for yourself, what should I feel about the other characters? They're, they're cool people, and that's really all I can say about them. They're just really cool characters. And that's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just nice. Um, it's nice to have these kind of characters, but at the same time, you wish there was like a, a little more soul in them. Because um, there isn't much of a character arc, really. They're just there to fight this cause. Well, with the exception of maybe one or two people, like um, the, the guy with all the weaponry and stuff, who you know keeps saying, you know, there, there is no force, you know, they're, they're, all the Jedi are dead, and uh, near the end, you, you kind of see sort of a little bit of revelation. It's, it's not a big revelation, but it, it, it's, it's a little bit there. Um, in terms of linking this movie with New Hope, they do it pretty well. You get to see the, the Death Star in all its glory. Um, you have one of the generals that's controlling the thing, and he's a really interesting kind of character. Because throughout the whole movie, he's asking for credit and control of this thing. Because he, he, I built it with my two hands. I should get all the credit I deserve. And CGI Tarkin is all like, "Er, you won't get credit at all." <laughs> um, uh, he, he has an interesting storyline. Just the fight for power. That he built this massive giant thing, and he wants to be the person at the buttons and the controls. Um, there's a nice thing there. He has a scene with Darth Vader, voiced by James Earl Jones, who apparently has a summer home on this volcanic planet now. <laughs> um, again, I'm not giving anything too big away, because the biggest one of all is the ending, which I'm going to save for the last few minutes of the episode, so I'm not, I'm not giving too much away. These are things being talked about, so don't worry. Um, but it is a, it's a really cool scene with Darth Vader. Um, you see him in this little tank or whatever, and then later he gets the suit on everything, he's voiced by James Earl Jones. That was a nice scene. I, I thought it was nice to see this big badass character once again, um, back to his roots after <laughs> seeing him in the prequels and be like, No! I had a love life and it went completely south for the winter! Um, He's back to his traditional roots, he's really badass. There's a scene near the end where it becomes a freaking horror movie! Like, slaughtering a bunch of rebels and everything, and it really, it really pushes the boundaries of how intense these movies can get. I actually wish there was more stuff like it. Just like this now, I'm trying to talk about this movie being distracted. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> um... <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, where was I? Um, Darth Vader. There's a scene near the end where he's go you know, going after the rebels per se, and he starts 
docking on one of the ships and starts, you know, really going after him. And it's really shot like a horror movie. It's amazing. He's just there, just slicing away, and then they're all like, ah, 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 ah. Um, It's great to see this character again and just show that there is no limits to how badass and villainy he is. It's the Vader we had in Empire Strikes Back where he's choking subordinates and doesn't give a crap. Um, that is how amazing this is. It's... Uh, it, it really comes in at a. It really comes in at a good time near the movie too. I will give it that much because after everything, they cap it off with just that, and it's like this is the perfect way to end it. You actually show how intimidating and mean this person is. It's great. Um, the final battle sequence on the the Imperial planet. Well, number one, I feel like a kid again watching that sequence. It is so packed with stuff that I can't even begin to fathom how awesome it was. They're on this beach-like vicinity, and the plans are in this giant archive place. Again, as I said, all these hard drives and stuff. So it's kind of like, oh, they now have digital medium in this place. That's interesting. <laughs> so much for paper. Um, that'd be kind of interesting if the blueprints were just in a little folder with like this little thing goes Death Star plans, do not remove. <laughs> no, no, do not fold. Because <laughs> in space, no one can hear you use semantics. <laughs> Mathematics. Um, so with this ending, they fill it to the brim with stuff. You have two characters trying to get the plans. You have the robot that's trying to fend you know everything off. You have all these rebel soldiers that are banging together and trying to help them out, and they're on the surface of the planet, um, fighting all these stormtroopers, and the battle just escalates. It really gets intense. It really, really lives up to the title Star Wars. It feels like something out of a war movie, like Bridge on the River Kwai or uh, Saving Private Ryan. Um, they're... The, the way it builds is just great. It starts off as like this one-to-one -one laser combat, and then they bring the Addas out. <laughs> and that's the moment where I literally feel like a kid again. I, I, I love these things. The, the four-legged walkers from uh, Empire Strikes Back, and then, of course, the little, the little two-legged ones from Return of the Jedi. Um, I haven't seen Return of the Jedi in a long time, but I do remember the Battle of Endor being a really good one because there's so much going on. You have Luke and Vader in the Death Star duking it out. You have Lando and the Rebels flying around trying to blow up the Death Star. And then you have Han and Leia and the Ewoks on Endor. Um, regardless of Ewoks... Again, I might have to watch that movie again because there are some things I do remember being good. Um, this movie... They do the same thing, but also they do new things. You actually feel like you're in the pilot seat at some points and seeing all these people... It's okay, Bella, it's okay. Just relax, all right? Oh, no. No, 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 no. You're not going to hijack this video. You're not going to hijack this video. Yep. I got to talk about this. I... No, 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 no. She distracts me too easily. Down, down, down. Get down. So the battle scene is really cool, and they do some things in space that we haven't seen before. Um, there's something to do with a Star Destroyer, which is really amazing, <laughs> which I'm not going to give away, because um, it, it's incredible to see what they do with the different things. It's not just models flying around going pew, 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 pew. Um, you actually see them swarm in, swoop in, like it's a dogfight from World War II. Um, there's a lot of shots in there, like you actually get inside the ship and see different angles and stuff. So it really... Bella! Get away from there! It really feels like the original fight sequence is only done a whole lot better. And I think that really kind of summarizes the film as a whole. It's just fun. There, there's a lot of cool scenes, there's a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of cool things, but there's not much substance. So if you want a cool Star Wars movie, I'd pick this over Rogue One any day. Um, hell, uh, the the whole new trilogy thing, I'd rather take this new anthology thing they're doing now than 
the the new trilogy that they're doing, you know, seven, eight, nine. Even though I am curious to see how number eight's going to turn out, because Carrie Fisher shot a lot of her scenes together. Um, but this anthology they're doing now with this movie and the the Han Solo and the Boba Fett films, it really makes me wonder just what holds for the future. So. Um, whatever they plan to do for these next movies, I'm game for them. I just wish there was a little more character, a little more stuff here and there, but for what it is, um, I'm okay with it. I, I'm really okay with this movie. Is it the best of the holiday season? No. Um, I still say that went to Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, because there was more nostalgic tinge there, and it really felt like a holiday movie as a whole. It, it played around with itself a little more. Um, this is a war movie. <laughs> this is a this is this is a blockbuster trying to be a war movie. Um, I think that speaks for itself. So, before I go into spoilers, um, and tell you to stop the video, I'm gonna give a couple of quick announcements. I guess you can say this is kind of like a New Year's resolution. One of them is to keep my dog out of the video. Um, but just a couple of quickies. Uh, season six of Vaulting will resume next month. Uh, episode 90, which was a co-review. <laughs> I've been holding that off for a long time now. I got a friend of mine helping me with it, so thankfully you should see it next month. Um, I'm not going to say the title, but it, it's it's definitely going to be worth the wait. And then afterwards I'm going to focus on the next 9 or 10 episodes. And then just go from there. Episode 100 will come out this year. I hope it does. I really, really want episode 100 to come out. Um, which leads me to my next thing, uh, Patreon. I updated it a year ago, um, just saying, show your support, earn some rewards, donate. For $5, you can send a request. It can be anything as long as it's pre-2000 and easy to access. And, yeah, I think that's all there. You can go to patreon.com slash vaulting and check it out for yourself. Um, wrote a novel. Still hasn't been picked up yet by agents. You can check it out at inkit.com slash moviewithbell90. Um, read it, review it, share it. Please do. I want to get this thing published off the ground. Um, it's a middle grade young adult fantasy book about a kid that befriends a pretty interesting creature who lives next door. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. And lastly, another Christmas gift that came in. I thank my sister for this in the t-shirt. I really, really do. <laughs> I love this show. Um, come next year, if I can, I'd love to do a whole show surrounding this. Uh, just just doing all the episodes. I think it'd be fun to do. Because um, there's a lot to work with. And it's, it's slowly becoming one of my favorite TV shows. Uh, so for that if it happens if it doesn't happen um it was a good attempt but part of me is like i, I really want to talk about this because not a lot of, not a lot of people are expressing the good of lost in space it's about the campiness which yeah th th there's a there's a camp factor to it but it's like a nice camp factor um and to cap everything off just to give you an idea of what's happening outside right now as we speak we're in massachusetts weather and look at that Look at that beautiful, beautiful snow. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> no, no, it'd be like Marvin the Martian. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> there it is. Snow. Wonderful, wonderful snow. January is off to a good start. Uh. Oh, man. With heat miser gone, nothing's going to be the same. <laughs> oh, George S. Irving, you lived a good life. <laughs> it reminds me of that line from Mystery Science Year 3000, um, where they're doing Santa Claus, Kong, and the Martians, and they're going through like all the different Christmas shows. <laughs> oh, look, we got Frosty the Snowman! Frosty the Snowman! Jackie Gordon did not die in vain! Uh, I'm gonna miss you, George. I'm gonna miss you. So, I'm gonna go into a huge spoiler right here, so if you don't want to hear it, stop the video right now. Okay? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about spoilers. Two huge spoilers. I know I said one, but I'm going to say two, because there's one I didn't talk about previously that's coming to mind. So if you do not want to hear about these, stop the video now and enjoy yourself. Okay? Okay. Bye. Okay. 
those who have seen the movie, and those who want to be spoiled, this is your last chance now. Sorry. Dog's always in the way. Where was I? Oh, yes. Um, for those who want to be spoiled, or who have seen the movie and want me to hear about these opinions, um, I'm just going to jump into two of the biggest ones. I know I didn't mention about one earlier, so I might as well mention it here. Um, we get a CGI Peter Cushing. <laughs> I kind of sort of mentioned it earlier, but... Yeah. Um, God, I can't say when the headroom's off. Sorry. There we go. But no, we get a CGI Peter Cushing, and it really depends on where you stand with this kind of technology. It's gotten to a point where we can emulate uh, past historical characters and make them like these digital beings. I mean, this technology is not even new. It's been around for a while. I mean, Forrest Gump, for example, and even then, Robert Zemeckis did the same thing by having a digital Humphrey Bogart in an episode of Tales from the Crypt, I think it was called You Murderer. So, um, there's been a lot of split, uh, split talks about whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing. Some people have been put off by the whole digital thing. And if I had to be honest, it's an interesting idea, but very distracting. Um, I was actually surprised at first because I was like, oh, that's really good makeup they're doing. They're making this guy look like Peter Cushing. Wait a minute, that that, that looks like Peter Cushing, but that, 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 that can't be possible. And when it was confirmed that, yeah, it, it's a digital effect, it became interesting because it, it was nice seeing them connect um, aspects of New Hope into this movie, but it felt like a huge distraction. Um, I'm not on the fence like other people are with, you know, oh, this is awful, blah, 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 blah. Um, I thought it was a neat effect, and that's really the term for it, neat effect. It was nice to see them go all the way and actually connect it. Um, I'm actually surprised to see how far they went, and it actually looks pretty good, too. Uh, you know, unlike previous movies that try to do that whole thing, um, I'm going to have to rewatch Tron Legacy to see how that holds up. Because like, I heard some people say that the, the younger Jeff Bridge is kind of uncanny. Um, I didn't mind that first time around. Actually, I, I might have to look at that again and see how it holds up. Um, but for this movie, I thought I thought the effects were nice on how, on how they rendered it. But at the same time, it was distracting. Because I kept thinking to myself, it, it's neat to see them bring this character back. But was it really necessary to go all the way and make him look like Peter Cushing? Couldn't they have a Peter Cushing look-alike? Or, at the very extent, could they put like pros prosthetics on someone? Nope, it has to be digital. It, it has to look exactly just like Peter Cushing. And it's like... Uh, I'll give you credit for going all the way, but, man, when you're looking at a, a special effect, you're looking at a special effect. It's really hard to distinguish between what is real and what is not. When you see someone with, like, you know, wrinkles and makeup on them, you're like, oh, that's great. That, that's really great to look at because it's right in front of you. But when you have an effect that isn't 100% there, and you know it's not 100% there, um, there's only two other ways to look at it, and these are the two big questions I consider when I'm looking at a, a computerized effect. Does it look well rendered into its environment? And does it really look that good? And I think most of the time, I was more concerned over the fact on how, A, they pulled it off. You know, obviously it has to be some motion capture kind of technology, and two, it made me question if they're really going to go all out and make this, you know, digital creation. Why can't it just be the same for the rest of the movie? It could have been a digital animated film, but oh no, it has to be live action, otherwise it can't be a Star Wars film because then it wouldn't be canon and blah 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 blah. It's uh. so I think on the whole, I'm not really against it, but at the same time, it's a neat little thing that I just don't think was really that necessary, e even though it does look impressive. Um, and the other big thing, too, is the tail end. This is something I'm sure people are going to talk about for a while. Um, you know the characters on the front cover of that poster? 
um, all of the characters on that, you know, poster for Rogue One, with the exception of Darth Vader, um, they die. <laughs> all those people that go in to get the plans, they're gone. They're, they're, they're never seen again. They get toasted <laughs> doing what they do. And it's funny because um, I looked very briefly on my phone, and as it turns out, there actually was a draft where some of the characters did survive, but then they realized, oh, this isn't going to work. You know, would it make sense to kill them off? And surprisingly, they never got any studio notes about it. So they're like, okay, we're glad we can do this. And yeah, it, it does make sense because we don't see them in the next Star Wars movies. Um, and it does make sense because it really lends itself to a more powerful, poignant transition from this one into New Hope. And... Excuse me. No, stop it, stop it, stop it. That's not a toy. Your bed is not a toy. Come on. Ugh. Here, there that, there that, there that. And that's why I can't do any videos. <laughs> um, where was I? Oh yeah, so... When, when, well, first off, the, there, there's one thing they add on that's actually pretty interesting. When we see a planet destroyed, we actually see a planet destroyed from the perspective of the character, and that's actually kind of nice. Um, we see the planet like slowly implode and everything, and we even get to be on the planet when it happens, so... It's a really nice touch, because when we see plants explode in the original Star Wars, they just explode. <laughs> As of course being the effects of the time. So, in this movie, they really go the extra mile. They show that destruction and devastation, which I thought was actually a really nice touch. So when that ending comes along, when our characters are on that planet, and the, the Death Star is destroying it, it leads into a very lot of good shots, especially with this Hiroshima-like sunrise. Um against this very, you know, tragic yet hopeful look where, they're, where the main characters are on the beach and they know that they're going down and this is the end. It's really powerful and it's, it's really emotional just seeing that happen. Um, and see all these characters have this journey up to this point where they're literally sacrificing themselves on the line just to, you know, save what they stand for is a really nice touch. And if they happen to survive, it wouldn't have been a bad ending. It would have been okay, but it wouldn't have been as powerful as what they went with. Um, and it's tough, because I know for sure a lot of parents are probably going to take their kids to see this movie. I wouldn't be too surprised at all if they did. Um, and it's hard when, after you see this movie, and you look on toy shelves and see Star Wars or on this character, blah, 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 and it's like, oh, oh man, I wonder how kids are going to take this. Um, which is why I wouldn't recommend this for younger kids at all. I'd say this is for older Star Wars fans, and uh, maybe kids eight and above can handle it. Th this truly earns the definition of a war movie. It's brutal. It's violent. It's not bloody, I'll give it that much. But for what it is, it really fits the definition of a war movie without going too dark or harsh. It's already a dark movie to begin with. Um... So if you're going to go see this movie, I'd say don't take any kids to see them or unless you want them to be dramatized. <laughs> Especially by Darth Vader just slicing people up. Um, it is really what it is. And again, like I said, this is the reason why I don't think this is like the best holiday movie. Because I don't think there's anything holly jolly about it. And considering the new year is coming up, I always like to end it on something hopeful. And you know, even though the movie does have a hopeful ending... When you go through this giant battle scene, and about all your characters that you're rooting for perish in that big battle, what do you have left to hold on to? Um, yeah, that's actually a pretty dark way to end this. Um, but, you know, these are tough times. Things are changing. Things are happening. Um, who knows what's going to happen in the new year. I'm just hoping that things do get better, especially on my end. Um, and even though I can't promise much, I can do what I can. Because that's, that's really all I have. What it takes, you know, doing these videos and everything. Um, whether it's vaulting or talking about the latest film. 
Um, so what I can promise you is that next month there will be more Cinevlogs, but there will also be vaulting as well. It will be there. So if you really miss that, if you really are a true fan of it, I'm pretty sure these next 10 or 11 episodes, no matter how much I make next year, um, might be one or two, you never know. Um, no matter how many new episodes of my show that I do, I still hope it's satisfactory, no matter whatever way I present them in. Um, take it for what it is, and for that, all I can say is, see you next year, guys. It's going to be a fun ride. Peace.